morning. We are at the Sheboygan County Historical Museum for our third Saturday. It is June 15th, 2013, and our topic today is Sheboygan River History. Um, you're going to be able to go through the decades and see um, lots of the different changes and things that happened along the Sheboygan River. Um, we have Bill Wongman here who is, uh, has a number of slides that he's showing of the early um, activity along the Sheboygan River. Um, then we have our former director, Barb Harker, who is going to talk about the mills um, that were along the Sheboygan River, and they were one of the first um, establishments that we saw along the river after the Indians. Um, then we also have um, some ec recreational activities that were along the river. We have Amanda Salzar from the John Michael Kohler Arts Center, and we have Jim Baumgart, who um, uses the Sheboygan River for many, many different activities, and he's very knowledgeable about the wildlife and the animals that are along the river. Then we have um, Scott Lewandowski, who has quite a few postcards of the early um, Sheboygan River and um, many um, interesting items that go along with the development of it. And then we also have Debbie Beyer um, and Vic Pappas who have been working with the Sheboygan River Basin Project and they have been working to clean up the river. And we have um, uh, um, person Vern Witt who grew up along the river and has many stories to tell of his adventures along the river. So we hope that you enjoy the day and that you um, enjoy seeing some of the many things that happen throughout the decades along the Sheboygan River. My name is Bob Harker. I'll be introducing this area of the display today. And a lot of the information is coming from the historian of Kiel, Ed McCarzak. And uh, so I'll be reflecting a lot of the information that he has provided to us. But first of all, I want to want you to see two pieces of equipment that we use in the full day education programs. And this first one is a saw. And Dale's going to operate the saw and I'm going to push on this. And you can see right here, there's the saw blade going up and down. And this is how the saw at the Wade House works, a muley saw. And we have pictures from the Wade House too. Okay, thank you. If you go right up there, you'll see some of the pictures from the Wade House. And that's what they offer here in Sheboygan County. Now today we're talking about the Sheboygan River. Uh, that's not on the Sheboygan River, but it's a mill very similar to other mills that were on many areas of the Sheboygan River. Okay, the next item we also use in the education programs, and this is a water wheel. Many of the mills in Wisconsin used a water wheel. They had to have a dam and they used a, a race for the water then to elevate the water enough to get on top of the wheel, generally on top of the wheel, and that's turning the wheel. That's going to turn all the mechanisms inside the mill, whether it's a grist mill or a lumber mill, um, and create the power. So early communities really needed the rivers and they needed rivers, particularly areas where there were falls, to get the elevation they needed. There are two kinds of power sources. One was the water wheel like you see here. The other is called the turbine. And the turbine was down in a tank of water. And as the water went through the turbine, it would create the power. We go from here up to a picture of Sheboygan Falls. And in Sheboygan County, that was uh, uh, the first community to, to uh, really be able to grow because of the natural falls in the Sheboygan River at that point. 
So there was a lot of industry there, much sooner than Sheboygan. Sheboygan didn't have falls. It wasn't until there was steam power that Sheboygan could develop as an industrial area. But Sheboygan Falls got a real early start, and you see here uh, working on the upper dam in 1898. And here's two more pictures of the same dam or dam in Sheboygan Falls and using the falls for water power. But it's interesting along the rivers that would create the power and pre create the opportunity for communities to develop, <clears throat> excuse me, was also uh, in the flood path in the spring with the ice jams and floods. And so it was also very common for there to be major damage to the mills and to the dams along the river sites uh, for the mills, roller mills and sawmills. Right now we're looking at uh, a map of Manitowoc County. Sheboygan River extends into Manitowoc County and actually into Calumet County as well. Uh, but if you look right here, here's the city of Keel and Keel has a mill dam in sight right here. Or, I'm sorry, right in this area, right here. And a little bit downstream from that, not very far, is Rockville with a dam as well. And farther downstream again is Mill Home right there. So it gives you a sense of, of how many mill sites there were along the rivers. And not just the Sheboygan River, but also many of the other rivers in Sheboygan County. We're looking at some of the other items on display at this point. That's the Arpke Mill in Franklin, uh, also on the river. And as many places along the river we talked about, there would be mills, there would be mills in, in Franklin, and we talked about Mill Home and Rockville and Keel. But there were a lot of other activities along the river as well. Of course, there would be fishing, there would be bathing and swimming, there would be uh, business of ice harvesting in the winter time, often called ice mining. And Keel was a particularly uh, good place for that. They had a large mill pond there. They could mine the ice and the railroad coming from Chicago to Upper Michigan was kind of a halfway point and they could just supply the railroad. Other companies locally supplied uh, residential and some of the other businesses in the community. But almost uh, all the rivers in the county and any place there was a wide place in the river or a mill pond, they would be harvesting ice. Even families along the, the rivers in Sheboygan County would be doing that as well. <clears throat> in the Keel area, in the Keel area, uh, the, a gentleman very early, uh, 1850s, put up what he called a hotel. It was more like a boarding house and very, very close to the river there. And because the river is such a focal point for transportation, for uh, fishing for all the other things that are going on. Uh, it's it just so Im important. Uh, but the weather can be in spring and the ice uh, and the floods and things can be a, a great deal of damage. But also in these early communities it was often used as a place to jump, dump garbage, dump things into the river. Um, eventually these things got cleaned up and as you'll hear later the major cleanup from industry here in Sheboygan uh, the lower part of the Sheboygan River. But early on, the, the rivers were often used for uh, filling in, filling in the swamp with dirt, but also the, the dark garbage and debris and things as well. Also in Keel, in the 1930s, there was uh, what's believed to be a WPA project for raising fish. And uh, that lasted until 1949 or 1950. And it was not very successful, and part of what they believe the reason to be that they were not uh, able to test for the kinds of uh, toxins already in the water from farm runoff and things like that. But it was one of the businesses along the river as well. Like most communities, uh, you needed a sawmill to build they have the lumber to build uh, houses, businesses. Uh, some po provided planks for the Calumet Plank Road, but you also needed grist mills or roller mills for um, providing food for people and for livestock for communities to thrive. The topic this month is 
down along the river. And the Sheboygan River, of course, was an extremely important uh, part of our city's development. The Sheboygan River runs a winding course of over 81 miles through four counties. Sheboygan, Fond du Lac, Calumet, and Manitowoc County was extremely important to the Indians because it was their highway to the center of the Sheboygan County. It was like their I-43 of the day. They had uh, large canoes that they could travel most of the way up and down the river, almost up to Lake Winnebago. A very early map of the area when Sheboygan did not exist, it was done in a survey by the government. The uh, map shows the harbor and a proposed pier that was really never built. And this was done by the uh, Army Corps of Engineers. And in later years, in a couple years after the uh, city started to become founded along the bank here, they dug through right here and straightened the river out so we didn't have this big bend in here. And then this land out here was, or this area out here was all filled in. And the city is out here somewhere now. So it's changed quite a bit. The first uh, known settlement we had was up along uh, the Sheboygan River at the first rapids, which is out near Esslingen Park. And there's a large marker out there. And if you ever get a chance, stop in the park and read that marker. It's quite interesting. And here's the city as it looked back in 1836 or 1837 with only about 12 or 14 houses in it. And you can see by then they did actually have a pier that they started to build out into the lake because ships couldn't get in here because of the sandbar that always uh, occurred right in the bend there. And by the 1870s and 1880s, the city began to flourish. another aerial view or bird's eye view of the city done by an artist. The peninsula in those days looked quite a bit different. Uh, this is where the Blue Harbor is back in here now. But this was the Grohl family that uh, settled it under the Homestead Act. And they had a hotel here called the Steamboat Hotel. And this is their tugboat, they had the Sheboygan tugboat lines to uh, bring uh, ships in and out of the, the harbor. And the Grohl family still lives in Sheboygan and they're still sailors after many generations. And we had a breakwater out in a lake that was not connected to any of the piers. It sat at about a 45 degree angle and it had a lighthouse on it that was made out of wood. And this was the first lighthouse the ship would see coming down the Great Lakes. And also we had uh, a catwalk along the main pier, the North Pier, where the lighthouse stood. In the back here, you can see the breakwater, but that was not connected to the shore. And the catwalk was so that the lighthouse keeper could get out to the light in heavy weather, because those lights had to be maintained every day. They were kerosene operated and they had to be uh, fueled and the wick had to be trimmed. The US Life Saving Station was located in the peninsula as well. They were in no way affiliated with the Coast Guard it was a special government organization. Later on, they were absorbed into the Coast Guard, but their station was also across the river. And here's the present the location of the Coast Guard station. This building is actually part of the today's uh, Coast Guard station. But this would have been taken maybe very close to the turn of the century. Ships couldn't get up and down the river on their own. They always had to have tugboats tow them up and down the river. And so the tugboat business was a very uh, uh, active business. The schooner they're towing is the schooner Rosabel, very well known in Sheboygan, owned by Sheboygan people. And the tug is the uh, Peter Rice, again, owned by the Sea Rice Coal Company, that by that time had uh, taken over the area uh, on the peninsula. And the rice coal facilities are back in here. They also had firefighting equipment on board the Peter Rice, and here's the Garden Toy Company fire. That was a huge raging blaze that they figured for a while might set the whole city on fire. And the Peter Rice is helping pump uh, water onto the fire. So again, the river, the river again was very important. Transportation, the river was very important to transportation. This is a, a ship owned by the Crosby Shipping Company, and they're coming in with a pick up more passengers. You can see all the people up on the deck here. These were beautiful cruise ships in size. 
that rivaled the very best ships on the Atlantic and the Pacific. They had uh, chefs that served uh, the finest food and they had crystals, chandeliers and fine china. It was a, a great time for cruising on the Great Lakes and Mr. Crosby, who operated out of Milwaukee, lost his life on board the Titanic. Pennsylvania Avenue Bridge, in the very early days, they used to call it the Shanghai Bridge, looking west, uh, up the hill here. Right up in here, there's a tavern, you can barely see it, but that building is still there yet. And the area down in, the, in the, what they referred to in those days as the flats, where the baseball complex is located now, was, was nothing but furniture factories. But between the, the uh, Grove family owning the peninsula and the coal company, there was a shipyard on the peninsula. And the largest ship they ever built there was the Helena, 220 feet long, a steamer. Here she's ready to be launched. The uh, Helena was uh, towards the end of the uh, shipbuilding. They had to move the shipyards up to Manitowoc because our river wasn't quite wide enough to launch ships. And you can see a lot of people have gathered. It was a big public event when a ship was launched. Schools were closed, factories closed. Everybody wanted to see the ship launched. Here's a, a tug to satisfaction being built in the shipyard. And here's the Lottie Cooper, the wreck that you see down on the Great Lakes. This is what Lottie Cooper looked like right after she was launched up in Manitowoc. In fact, the company that built the Lottie Cooper in 1876 is still in business today. And here's a schooner going out of our harbor with a load of, uh, looks like cordwood piled up on the deck. There were hundreds and hundreds of these schooners on the Great Lakes and many of them came and went out of Sheboygan. Here's the fine old steamer of the Sheboygan, a side wheel steamer. Again, very luxurious on board, a very comfortable way to travel in a day when roads were very poor. Here we have a bunch of, uh, a group of ladies picnicking along the river and the river was very much different than it is now. The water was so clear you could see the bottom in 10 feet of water and most people who lived along the river drew their water right out of the river, which I don't think is something you'd want to do today. And of course, industry flourished along the river because they could ship things out, they could bring things in. Uh, over 850,000 pieces of furniture were shipped out of Sheboygan in 1880. So you can imagine the scope of that, uh, how many people in the city worked in the furniture industry when the city was probably only about 15 or 16,000 people. And it's a little hard to read, but it's a report from the uh, chief engineers of the U.S. Army who kept track of how much stuff was shipped in and out of the city. And up on top, he talks about something about uh, during the entire shipping year, some 1,200 ships came and went out of Sheboygan. This is the Crocker Chair Company. This building right here is still in existence today. Uh, for some years, it was the City Streets Restaurant, which is still there, but they're no longer in business. It's now a uh, cooking school, but that building is still there. But the rest of this is all gone, but Crocker had over 600 people working for him. And then there was the Phoenix Chair Company, and there were so many others, I could do nothing but show you furniture companies for the next 20 minutes and some of the wooden uh, stuff they built. This is bent wood furniture. They would take these uh, pieces of wood and put them in a steam box and steam them and they got very soft and they could bend them in all kinds of shapes and then uh, put the rattan seats in them and it was very popular stuff. And today much sought after by collectors. Sheboygan Mineral Water Company existed along the river Sheboygan Mineral Water Company was in the building that later years was owned by Very Fine Dairy Company. And they bottled mineral water. It was the same vein of water that came up from Fountain Park. And it had a heavy mineral taste and tasted very rusty. But they bottled it and sent it all over the world. In fact, the President of the United States, I've forgotten which one it is, ordered uh, mineral water shipped to the White House frequently. And if you tasted the stuff, it tasted awful. So I guess people thought that if it uh, tasted that bad, it had to be good for you. And then there was the Aladdin Soap Company down along the river. That was in the area of 22nd in Indiana. I doubt that ships ever got that far up because they would have had to open a Jersey Avenue bridge. And I never saw that the New Jersey Avenue bridge opened. The 14th Street bridge used to open, but I never saw anything on the New Jersey Avenue bridge. 
And then there was the fishing industry. Here's a steam tug parked in the harbor. And it was a brutal uh, way to make a living because they worked all year long. Whenever they could go out, they went out and the tugs would come in heavily coated with ice. It was a cold, wet job. Here we see one of the tugs frozen in. And then Rice Coal Company established their business down there. And here we see a bunch of coal men ready to go out for the day. That was hard work. In many cases, they had to carry the coal up to the house and dump it in with canvas baskets. Recently, I gave up a show at one of the grade schools. And in talking about coal, the kids asked what coal was. They didn't know what coal was. They had never seen coal. And it was an electric car they used to run around in the yard at the uh, Rice Coal Company in the old docks down there with a steamer coming in. Rice was a very, very big company. They were all over the Great Lakes, Mississippi River. They had dozens of docks. They had three docks in Milwaukee alone. And their ships were always beautifully painted, uh, white and black, shiny, kept very clean. And here's a scene in their yards. And then there was the uh, 880, a patrol craft that was uh, kept down at the uh, Naval Reserve Building, which stood back here, which is no longer there. And that eventually was sold to Denmark and they used it as a training vessel. So that's about uh, all for this uh, short program. And there's many other exhibits in the museum that you're welcome to uh, go and enjoy. Hi, I'm Vern Witt. I'm a native of Sheboygan. I uh, am a fisherman by avocation and enjoy the Sheboygan River from its very origins right through to the lake. Uh, I have fished most of the river. I don't know of any particular area that I missed, but depends on what kind of fishing you would like to do. Uh, I've, many times I used to go for northern pike. This favorite place was Johnsonville and of course that became fished out so then we went after smallmouth bass and this era was the area around Sheboygan Falls it was rocky bottom and uh, they loved crossfish so they had a good supply of food there the uh, upper reaches the small streams had trout in them uh, many of the trout streams were planted but there was one stream that was a native with trout, native trout in it, and this was called Shewitt's Creek, and it uh, dumped into the river just east of Highway 57. Uh, this stream has native has trout in it to this day. I shouldn't call them native because they've all been planted in that stream, but it holds trout today in a very small stream, maybe two, three feet across. And there aren't too many fishermen that bother to go up that little stream. As a result, there are native trout in there, or planted trout in there to this day. Um, we used to uh, go ice fishing along the river, but occasionally we would put a boat in. And I and a, two other fellows were occupants of the boat. And after we got done fishing, uh, the guy who caught the first fish, had a bite of a round of drink after that. So one day we got into the, into the boat and we started fishing. Finally Clarence caught a little fish. And uh, that was the first fish caught. So his brother says, well Vern, he says, we can put bait on our hooks now, he's got to buy. So uh, I used to go there with my brother too. And one day he caught a small bluegill, oh, it must have been about two or three inches tall, long. And I said, hey, that's big enough for bait. He said, hey, that's a good idea. So we fast, refastened it on his line and he's whipping it out there and he hit himself in the back of the head with the damn thing and actually made him jar. And I said, no, Bob, you gotta use live bait, not dead bait. Well, this goes on and on. We, can tell you stories all day about it, but I've enjoyed the Sheboygan River ever since I've moved into the area, and I think the people who live here in Sheboygan should be proud that they have a stream as well as as well maintained as it has been. 
many streams were followed by mankind and uh, the Sheboygan Falls or the Sheboygan River is not an exception but it's been only in the lower reaches that they have had a lot of contamination and they've just finished as of two days ago they claim that they finished dredging all the uh, sediment out of the Sheboygan River that was contaminated. Well, we will see in time how it works out. But uh, we're real happy that it was done. I have been in groups that have been fighting for this since 1988. And there, are, of course, there are, I believe there were five different groups in that time. They would come and go depending on funding. And finally, they uh, got the funding and I have belonged to the Sheboygan River Basin group, which has been the longest running uh, for many years. She was the lady who got me interested in the Sheboygan River Basin group, so I gotta blame her for that. But it's, it's been a good run, and I hope to fish in it for some years to come. And uh, I had my both my knees replaced and, because I was having trouble walking, but I still get into the rivers, and I fish from the water, and uh, it has been a successful operation, and I'm enjoying it. And I'm going to be 89, and uh, I am having fun with the Sheboygan River, and I hope everybody else. I'm Debbie Beyer. I'm a natural resources educator with UW Extension, and I've been working on Sheboygan River uh, community education for about uh, about seven years, and. Most heavily, I've been working on the river for the past uh, four years. And my involvement includes coordinating the Fish and Wildlife Technical Advisory Committee, as well as uh, developing materials and programs to help get the word out to folks, uh, help people understand what's been going on with the river as far as the cleanup of the PCBs and PAH contamination as well as the fish and wildlife habitat restoration. So I have a map next to me that shows the Sheboygan River area of concern, which is a Great Lakes area of concern. The small map over in this portion of the poster shows the 43 areas of concern throughout the Great Lakes region that were designated in 1987, and the Sheboygan River is one of those. These are all really uh, industrial areas that were contaminated with uh, byproducts of industrial processes, um, oil, tar, uh, liquids that had PCBs in them and so forth. And so the Sheboygan River had uh, contamination from PCBs and PAHs. The lower 14 mile stretch is the area of concern. So essentially from the Sheboygan Falls Dam down to the shore of Lake Michigan. And uh, the dredging and uh, habitat work primarily took place in 2012, although there was some dredging that began um, in 2006 in the upper portions of the river uh, for peace to remove some of the PCB contamination. Uh, the bulk of the dredging work happened in this zone that's kind of highlighted in red in 2012. Uh, 300,000 cu cubic yards of contaminated sediment were removed and this also is the general area of the biggest habitat projects and so uh, in total about a little more than 80 million dollars was spent on um, removing the contamination as well as improving some of the habitat along the river along with the contamination uh, there also has been degradation of habitat and fish and wildlife populations through the years just from the change in the land use. Historically, this area was forested and um, also had a mosaic of wetlands interspersed throughout. And so you can see the landscape has changed tremendously over time as we've built cities and villages and converted land to farming and residential areas and so forth. So that creates great changes in um, the fish and wildlife that live here as well. And um, so the main habitat projects are at Esslingen Park. Also, uh, there's a, a pond that was developed in the uh, 80s, I believe, um, when the roads were built through here. And that wasn't functioning as a, as a wetland, really, the way it should. And so 
That has been uh, improved to serve more as a, a wetland to uh, hold storm water and so forth uh, before it infiltrates into the soil. Um, there's also a wayside area at the intersection of Taylor Drive and Indiana Avenue. Uh, that habitat was improved and access to the river was improved for people as well. And then uh, this island complex here we call Wildwood Islands. Uh, the islands have uh, eroded and broken apart over time. It used to be one larger island and now is a complex of several islands. So um, that island was shored up essentially along the banks so that it won't erode but will rather grow. And the habitat also was improved. Uh, a lot of the vegetation that was growing on the island um, was what we consider to be invasive species. Uh, they're not native and they tend to take over things. They're quite aggressive so those were removed and replaced with native trees and shrubs and plant other plants. And then Kiwanis Park was another huge habitat project. Kiwanis Park covers three quarters of a mile of shoreline. And so that was another great opportunity to do some habitat improvement um, for birds. Since we're right along Lake Michigan, the Sheboygan River corridor is potentially a really important uh, habitat component for birds and bats that migrate north and south along the Lake Michigan shore. And those are long, strenuous journeys, and so they need uh, good habitat to rest and refuel for the rest of their journey. So the goals for the habitat restoration work in this portion of the river is to get um, valuable habitat for fish and wildlife closer to Lake Michigan um, to help those critters that are migrating, as well as to provide um, better fish habitat throughout these stretches of the river um, and also to just make it a nicer place for people to enjoy the river and the community in which they live. I'm trying to think of any other details folks would want to know. I think that sums it up for me for now. Hi, I'm Vic Pappas. I'm with the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. I work out of the Plymouth office. I'm a um, Lake Michigan field supervisor now, but I've held a number of positions in DNR over the last 32 years and worked in Sheboygan for a lot of my career in the Sheboygan area. And I um, uh, used to do landfill inspections, work with uh, plants up here on hazardous waste material type handling. Um, for quite a few years, I was the watershed supervisor for the Sheboygan Basin. so. Uh, been involved with the Sheboygan River quite a bit over my career. And um, just a few words about, um, you know, we've been working with the county and a lot of our partners over the years on different kinds of projects, everything from agricultural best management practices to uh, dealing with urban runoff and stormwater. Um, and doing uh, monitoring in the river. We have some biologists that have um, uh, done quite a bit of monitoring over the years and um, trying to um, do what we can to improve water quality and habitat in the river uh, for many years. Um, with respect to the uh, Sheboygan River cleanup, my initial involvement was probably back as a solid waste inspector in the early 1980s when uh, Tecumseh was a uh, manufacturing plant in Sheboygan Falls that uh, had been identified as the ones who uh, allowed PCBs to get in the river um, way up about uh, near the river mile 14 or so. Um, they uh, took some immediate action to remove materials from their um, bank area and from immediate area uh, right in f behind their plant. All of that material was considered um, uh, toxic material in the soil that they had to remove and they took that material um, to a storage facility uh, in Sheboygan Falls and then eventually it was shipped to a, a hazardous waste landfill out of state. And then over the years um, Tecumseh hired a number of companies to uh, uh, do analysis and assessment of the river in terms of where the contamination was from um, 
uh, the PCB discharge that occurred up there. Um, and there was also ongoing uh, fish assessment uh, that was going on t because PCBs bioaccumulate uh, through the food chain and uh, they also um, have the potential uh, to impact human health uh, by folks who eventually end up eating the fish. Um, and um, so, so the fish advisory was posted for the river um, uh, quite some time ago in the 1980s um, that advised people not to eat resident fish from the Sheboygan River at all, um, the fish that were from the river. And um, so in the late 1980s, there was some more removal that um, Tecumseh paid for in the upper river up near Sheboygan Falls uh, into Kohler a little bit. And then um, there was um, quite a few discussions over the years regarding uh, how clean is clean and what kind of cleanup should occur. Um, there was what was called a feasibility study done in the early 1990s, or excuse me, late 1990s on what could be done to remove the rest of the PCBs. Um, in 2000, uh, the US EPA issued what's called a record of decision, a sort of um, stated what the cleanup objectives were for the river under their uh, Superfund program. And since that time, we've been working with a lot of partners um, trying to make sure that that cleanup occurred. And um, uh, t another firm called Pollution Risk Services got involved around 2004. They had a relationship with Tecumseh to do the cleanup work. and. Um, so they started dredging in uh, 2006, 2007 in the upper river to remove uh, most of the contamination up there. They dredged about 20,000 cubic yards out of the river of contaminated sediment uh, from the river. Uh, and then um, um, went through some more work over the years to get uh, identify what we need to do in the lower river and the inner harbor. And um, that work actually started in 2011 um, and com was completed uh, here actually uh, in January of 2013. So um, uh, a lot of effort to get to that point. And in addition to what was required by um, the responsible party, in this case Tecumseh, uh, there was uh, another uh, contamination site at the f um, former Camp Marina site that was cleaned up in 2011. Um, those were coal tars associated with, oh, going back to the 1930s really, when they uh, used to gasify coal and or had this coal tar that remained, uh, that got in the river. And that was cleaned up in 2011 by the Wisconsin Public Service Corporation. And so we had the PCB cleanup going on by this pollution uh, uh, PRS company, uh, and uh, we also had uh, uh, Wisconsin Public Service and their contractor doing a cleanup in 2011 in the river. And then um, we were also able um, to obtain funding through the Great Lakes Legacy Act um, to um, do what was called a betterment action, which was um, to improve the river even uh, um, more than what was required under the uh, regulations. So we uh, formed a team and um, uh, of county, city, um, the responsible parties, DNR, the uh, EPA, and uh, a number of others. UW Extension played an important role for public education. And we um, were able t to do a uh, a project uh, where we uh, removed a lot more material from the river, uh, including the uh, inner harbor area from East Street to the mouth uh, of what would be more slightly contaminated material that was not required to be removed, but was still um, uh, there and preventing uh, dredging from occurring um, because of the cost involved. And, uh, so in 2012, uh, we implemented the Legacy Act project and um, 
uh, all together, all four projects that were going on. We did a habitat project that removed some contamination from some floodplain areas. We were close to uh, 400,000 cubic yards of contaminated material that came out in 2012. So it was uh, quite a great feat to get all of that work done in one year. Uh, it took a lot of cooperation by a lot of people, but um, uh, we think we did a, a very good cleanup. Um, we hope to be doing a lot more assessment of the river and the fish over the next few years to see uh, how well we did. And um, we're very optimistic that we're going to see improvement uh, in the fish and the wildlife. Uh, so. I'm Scott Lewandowski. I'm the assistant city historian for the city of Sheboygan and I brought a collection of postcards of showing the Sheboygan River or the bridges that were over the Sheboygan River. And I have postcards from Sheboygan, Sheboygan Falls, Johnsonville, Kohler. And for some of the postcards I enlarged the pictures and put those on display also. Most of the postcards date from about 1905 through 1920. Well, they did. On this side I took some postcards and taped them together. They show a panoramic view of Sheboygan looking at 14th Street from Kiwanis Park, what is now Kiwanis Park. You know, the Sheboygan River, which uh, passes uh, from uh, Fond du Lac County and uh, swings through uh, Calumet and, and uh, Manitowoc County, spends most of its time in Sheboygan County. And the beautiful thing about uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the river, it, it goes through the Sheboygan Marsh, it goes through uh, areas like Rockville and, and Keel, and it uh, covers areas uh, down through the Sheboygan Falls, Kohler, and into the Lake Michigan areas, and the diversity of animals and fish and, and birds uh, in that area is far more phenomenal than people realize. We have, of course, the great uh, migration of, of salmon and trout that move up. Uh, we've got a wonderful small bass bass uh, fishing and great uh, um, uh, some great northern uh, pike that will move up uh, from, from the lake. Uh, and you've got uh, animals that travel, you've got coyotes, you've got turkeys, a sandhill crane lives along the, the area. Uh, and, and we're blessed with some of the uh, best agricultural areas that sort of parallel the uh, river. But for people that like recreational you've, areas, you've got snowmobiling during the wintertime. People can go across the marsh, even when there's no snow on the ground. They can uh, canoe and and uh, they can kayak. Uh, I've gone from St. Cloud in Man uh, Fond du Lac County uh, to the Sheboygan Marsh Dam any number of times. And the frogs and the sandhill cranes and the geese and the ducks uh, that you'll find as you move from one curve to another on the river bends uh, is, a, is a very relaxing and, and, and enjoyable uh, way of, of spending a day or a, or a, or a week uh, uh, people have camped out on the, uh, at the marsh, but uh, we do have a diversity there, and if you see the uh, 
the uh, Henschel uh, Museum and some of the artifacts that have been uh, brought by the Indians of 10,000 years ago, these areas uh, exist on lands that parallel the Sheboygan River. So it's been a uh, resource for uh, everybody for uh, a thousand of years and in recent years, of course, since about the 1800s, uh, the people that have moved to Sheboygan County have made this uh, place a, uh, uh, an area that they like to uh, enjoy and the river is enjoyment. We have, of course, uh, a variety of things here today uh, for people to uh, look at uh, some of the backwaters, some of the uh, um, uh, bird books, uh, some of the uh, uh, fish items that uh, people uh, might have an interest in, and uh, the experience that people have had. Uh, they've brought it in today, they've talked about them, some of their experiences camping with Boy Scouts and uh, others. It's been a uh, uh, nice rewarding time meeting some of the people that have come to share their stories and ask questions about birds and fish and wildlife. It's the uh, exciting time to uh, uh, live in the Sheboygan area because we just finished a 80 to 100 million dollar effort to clean the lower part of the Sheboygan River, a, uh, a complement to the state and federal and county and city uh, people in Falls and beyond of Sheboygan uh, that have made this happen. And now we've got a river that uh, is uh, able to be developed uh, even better and people that want to fish and canoe and kayak will have a water that is more pristine than it was before. So we have many things going for us and this river is part of Sheboygan County. It is uh, a lifeblood that brought people here it's a river that people like to see and use, and it's a uh, activity that uh, uh, we could just share by by looking and uh, watching the migrations of birds and ducks in the fall of the year. It's a great uh, um, a piece of history, and it's a great piece of recreational area that hopefully everybody will enjoy. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of fish and fishing in the Sheboygan River. Um, you know, when you go way back before settlement times, uh, this was a, a fairly important river to Indian tribes that would camp out near Taylor Drive and that general area of the Sheboygan River. And fish for, for lake trout and brook trout and probably some of the warm water species like suckers, whenever they could get concentrations of fish coming up the river, they would harvest those fish and probably preserve them in some manner by drying or salting down, most likely drying those fish, and then use them through whatever part of the year they could to subsist on, on fish. So my understanding is that there was a fairly significant uh, camp of uh, Indians down in that general area, uh, because that was the first rapids or major rapids on the river where they could easily access those fish as they came upstream. The lake trout probably didn't do as much spawning in the Sheboygan River as they do out in Lake Michigan. They're generally reef spawners. But brook trout, which were the other native trout species that would come up the Sheboygan River, most likely were able to come up the river and then head even further in, inland to maybe the upper Onion River, places like that where they would then try to spawn and then the adults would most likely drop back down into Lake Michigan. Uh, the young of the year fish would probably stay in the Onion River and other tributaries and develop and then come down as they reached adulthood into Lake Michigan. So as far as the original trout species, it was lake trout and brook trout only. Um, then that shifted back in the early 1960s, late 1950s, when the Pacific salmon were brought into Lake Michigan. First of all, they were brought in to control the alewife populations, which were follow, following the beaches with their vast numbers of fish. They would die, wash ashore, and um, cause problems. So the salmon were introduced initially to 
control ale life and they being what they call anadromous fish where they live their their life out in the ocean and then come up into freshwater streams to spawn in in our case they would stay out in Lake Michigan and grow and then move into the Sheboygan River in an attempt to spawn and they still do that to this day it was initially my understanding were is that coho salmon were brought in. Uh, they're also called silver salmon. And they were followed up by Chinook salmon, also called king salmon. The king salmon or Chinook are the bigger of the two species and get to be fairly large. There were probably times when Chinook salmon up to 30 pounds in size would come up into the Sheboygan River in fall in an attempt to spawn. The Chinook would come up in September the coho would come up more in October to attempt to spawn. And in fact, they would spawn, but because there aren't enough springs and good enough water quality in the river, their eggs would most likely die. Um, and primarily water temperature would be the biggest factor in that the, the salmon eggs develop during winter and hatch out generally in February or March but in a Sheboygan River, if, if there aren't enough springs to warm the water, ice crystals that are more or less arrow-shaped and would actually pierce the eggs and kill the eggs. So even if water quality were acceptable to the salmon, they still would not probably survive because of cold temperatures. Because there are actually times when the river runs actually below freezing in temperature. It'll get down to 30 and 31 degrees but because the water is flowing, it doesn't have time to, to solidify in, in large chunks. Um, but with the salmon uh, coming into the Sheboygan River, it really created a huge sport fishery. Um, initially, anglers were able to use snag hooks and they would cast those hooks into the river and, and yank the, the line and the hook and try to snag the fish. Uh, the thought was that salmon really weren't going to feed at that time of year, which is incorrect, but um, they, that was the major method of, of catching salmon as they came up, up river. And it drew people in from uh, Iowa, Illinois, Minnesota, Wisconsin, of course, and other states would actually come here, some with freezers on small trailers, fill those up with fish, um, and then haul them back home. And of course, the salmon come up upriver. They uh, do not return back into Lake Michigan. They die after they spawn because uh, Pacific salmon particularly, that's their life cycle. As they come in, they spawn, and they die. Um, back in, I believe, probably the late 1980s, I don't know the exact year, Snagging was, uh, was eliminated as a method of catching fish. And the primary reason for that was that the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources was also stocking rainbow trout, which they call steelhead trout in Lake Michigan. Um, and steelhead will actually come up river, spawn, or eat eggs of the, some of the salmon and then they'll drop back down into Lake Michigan. They, they can survive many years. So that's the history of the sport fishery. Um, and primarily it's a warm water fishery, a, a very good warm water fishery now. Um, after the Clean Water Act in 1972 created a situation where the river cleaned up and smallmouth bass in particularly also did well.